successful in your, in your mind. And to her, she said that I was able to be honest with my employer uh, about my history. I walked into an environment that was empathetic about my experiences and used my experiences for strengths for the company. And so, Okay, that's six minutes. Oh, this is a hot mic. <laughs> so, the first question I have is, what's your plan to scale?
it's great what you're doing, so high five for that. But uh, as far as PR to get more recognition, uh, what, what are your plans for PR uh, moving into the new year? Do you have a, a, a specific plan or, or different things you want to do to get recognized on a, on a bigger level? Or can you tell, tell us about that? Our priority right now is, is focusing in Tulsa and in, our, in the customers that we do have right now. So in the next six months, our strategy is to really maintain the quality of the customers that we have now. So maintain those restaurant accounts and the grocery stores accounts and get the most out of those and to use those as our PR and as our marketing you know, within the grocery stores to access and reaching out into the community like that. And, and the most successful PR that we've had is through the farmers markets because we're able to directly you know, converse with each individual customer and tell our story. I have a question that uh, this is sort of piggybacking off of Dustin. But can you explain the process of a few of the employees that you hired, what their backgrounds are? I know you mentioned incarceration, and then what that sort of process has looked like, the success, or as a, if there were any struggles. Can you sort of talk us through that? We've had 100% success so far, so I know that's not going really to be true for, for every case. Uh, but what we initially started heavily read by partnering with organizations in Tulsa that already provide services to the women. Uh, so we know we're not expert counselors or we don't know much about the criminal justice system in Oklahoma. Uh, but, but by partnering with organizations like Resonance and Women Recovery, we're able to provide that service and recommend uh, potential employees for heavily read and so that's been a continual relationship too. So I'm able to meet with the, the directors of residents and talk about how Heavenly Red's being impactful and things we can work on and discuss how the progress is for our employees now, making sure that it's effective. Can I ask another question? Sorry to steal your thunder. What's um where, where are you guys doing your baking right now? And what does that look like? And how are you, you need to scale that side of things as well? And sort of talk us through where you are with that. Yeah, that's a great question. So we started out of bootstrap that first month or so of starting Heavenly Red, realizing that you have to have commercial kitchen space in a home in a certain company. And so we've been using the uh, kitchen space at the French Inn, a local restaurant, early in the morning before their lunch staff gets there. So we're there for 435 to 9 or 10. Uh, and so right now that's working for us. We're working on the bartering system. We're able to provide them their dinner rolls and we're able to have kitchen space early in the morning. So it's working right now, uh, but looking at scaling in the future, definitely the, the option of having our own space and more hours later in the morning too. It's ideal. <laughs> That's kind of my question. It's kind of what your initial startup was. So your initial startup cost, but also kind of um, how many people are in the company right now, and uh, you know, the second part too. What is it like finding those first distributors in places that are reselling your product? And, uh, Paul, what, how do you find success? I mean, you say successful and growing. How do you find it? Kind of a three-part question. Okay, three-part question. I'll answer the third question first. How do we define success? And the first measures of success, just as the summer experiment, were to see, do we have real customers? Do, do real businesses want this? Could we land five restaurant accounts in four months? Is there a demand for the bread? Uh, and that, we, we had that immediately. We have, we have several restaurant owners that want our product and keep buying our product. So success, profitability point, and we have real customers, we have, we're real business, profitable, we have real employees, uh, and, and so looking further, that's success within our program, our deployment, and also if we can continue to maintain those accounts. And your other question was, how did we go about getting the accounts? The cinnamon rolls are here. <laughs> Do you have cinnamon rolls in the coffee? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so his question was, how do we initially start getting restaurant accounts? Well, the first one was great because we had the kitchen 
space angle, hey, we're going to use your kitchen space. Would you like to sell our bread to you? How much would you pay for it? You know, having that immediate relationship. Um, but then following that, it was, you know, just knocking on people's doors and talking to them about what we're doing and, and seeing if they're interested. And that, that was my strategy. Did you have another question too? What was your first question? Initial startup. So I was in, decided to relaunch Heavenly Bread when I was living in New York. And so all this startup happened on my computer kind of in the back of the class in New York. So the startup was, was like having the, the barriers, the major blockers were having kitchen space, having a health permit and a license, um, you know, making sure that we had you know, a whole team. My cousin and I, Jack, we went through all of the, you know, what's our logo going to look like, let's make it, what do we want our website to look like, things like that. Uh, but the, the major things were getting kitchen space and having a whole
Saturdays or have soccer games or something. Uh, and then also during the lean months, during the winter months, when the farmer's market's closed, it's difficult for the farmers to, to continue their, their initiatives. So the idea with this was to tap into the, the market, uh, to tap into the population that don't go to the farmer's market and to provide the, the farmers at the, the street, the revenue stream through the, the winter months and, and year round. So you go, the local pantry is a farmer's market essentially, where you go online and you select exactly what you want. It's a shopping cart style. Deliver right to your door, or we have pickup locations at the Get Through Green and then also at the new Archer Market. I have a question. When you talk about partnering with, with business schools, how would that work? Is that like a, are you looking to franchise with business schools, or is that um, could you be more specific about what that arrangement would look like? And we're in the we're in the process of working out the details on that. Uh, but, but essentially that the idea is for it to be a franchise model where they would be purchasing the Heavenly Bread kit in the service of using our model for their curriculum. And then it would be uh, up to the students if they want to continue Heavenly Bread post the semester of the year. Uh, or if it would con if an option is to continue it for multiple semesters and have different classes continue to come in and run it. Uh, or to, to hire the good Question in the back. I know there's there's a big push that we learned last week with Topeka about seed to cup. Is there any sort of aspect in how you source your 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 wheat and all the materials that you use in your bread that you could also have some sort of social impact with or seed to cup? Right, right. So the, the question is about our ingredients and how, how we source our ingredients and our intention to do that. And our priority is sourcing ingredients is the highest quality uh, from quality aspect from nutrition and then also from you know an integrity who's our farmer and so for our honey we're sourcing we think it's the base, best test and the best okay. best taste highest quality and if we're sourcing from a local farmer We're sourcing our wheat berries not from Oklahoma but from a farmer in Montana. And so you're wondering why are we doing that? Uh, why aren't we sourcing locally? But the the farmer in Montana has wheat berries that are highest protein content, which if you try our bread, it's really still light and fluffy, but still really dense in nutrients, and that's because of the protein content and the wheat that we're using. And so that's our intention with that. And we're also sourcing our salt from uh, Redmond, Utah. The salt plains in Redmond, Utah are all natural, preservative-free. Essentially, like I explained the wheat process, a lot of the salt that we find has been stripped of its natural nutrients, and, and so, and you, you know, it's white, but really real salt is pink and has some brown flakes, and it's colorful, uh, and so that's why you're sourcing our, our salt from, from Utah. Cool. Hey, Bill. So we don't have facilities to mill our own wheat or anything like that. Do you have uh, any aspirations to sell flour or the heavenly bread brand? As, as we make all of our pastries in the house, we would love to use their ingredients and support a local company like you. But is that, is that an opportunity? I, I think it is an opportunity. It's something that we've thought about but haven't implemented. Our mill that we've started with uh, isn't a huge industrial mill that, that would be able to feed all of them. Tulsa is a great cooper to just with flour alone. Uh, and so that's why we haven't been distributing yeah. that. And we also wanted to focus on our own product first. Uh, but it's definitely an opportunity for us to, to still support our, the farmers that we have and also the, the nutritional value of our food. So, so the question is, 
there are customers that have been gluten intolerant uh, that try our bread and don't have any problems and they have a smooth digestion. Uh, and that's because of this, or the, of the wheat berries that we're using. So we, we use the entire wheat berry. We don't strip it or bleach it or it's pure wheat berry that's milled straight into flour. So it's a really natural, simple, six-step process for baking the bread. And so what I found is that this 20-step you know, convoluted mess has been really difficult on our, on our digestion, digestive system. So the same thing that how we eat salt that's been processed and extracted of its natural nutrients, uh, that, that it's difficult for us to, you know, over time to always have this, uh, this industrialized food, food system. Uh, and so I've, I've found that you know, I grew up on the bread, so I didn't notice any difference. But I found that uh, several of our customers have been able to tolerate our bread uh, different than, than other breads. So, uh, All right, let's give Adele a hand. <laughs> Just a few um, quick announcements this morning. Um, next week, we will not be meeting. Um, there's a holiday that day, I guess. Um, and then also the following week we won't be meeting. So January 8th will be our next meeting. We'll start off the uh, beginning of the year. So if you guys could put that on your calendar, Wednesday mornings. Um, a couple of announcements this morning. The uh, Tybros is having an ugly sweater karaoke uh, this Friday at 9.30 at Elote. There's a $50 cash prize. Um, also, the uh, Buffalo Lounge is down in Austin, Texas. It, they have an elevator pitch competition, so if your business wants to uh, submit to get down there, they, there's a $10,000 cash prize for a company down there. That, um, the submissions are due by uh, Friday the 20th, so that's the Buffalo Lounge in Austin. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up Tim so he can introduce our uh, next Announcer Tim, um, you ready for it? Alright, I'm pleased to announce this next company goes by sort of two names. It's A Child's Cup Full, and now they're sort of rebranding toward Toys for Hope. And it's a very interesting uh, story, first of all, that I'll let them share. That they basically build educational toys, and they do it, the women that they employ live in uh, West Bank. That was a strip. So I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Jeanette Abashi. She works over at OU Tulsa. Give it up for Toys for Hope. Thank you. 
keep them, and I'll come back and tell you what to do with them. And uh, I went back and I learned that the sewing machine came from a uh, refugee from uh, Honor, which is responsible organization responsible for, uh, for the refugee camp, United Nations organization. So I went and met with them and I said, could we, could you help me support salaries of women for coming six months if I develop a program, a project that, or a company that we develop uh, toys, uh, educational toys? And they said, okay, but we don't understand what you're doing. We have no clue. Our, actually, our uh, company is the first in the Middle East that produce educational toys from Sarawas. So they gave us six months salary for women, and they gave us 40% uh, of material. So we started a pilot for six months, and we started designing, uh, we hired the designer, and we started hiring the staff. After, uh, after six months, I went back, it took a year until they gave us the six months, and I uh, was trying to go and look for funding, and I met the U UN uh, United Nations Development Program. They gave us $150,000 to continue the project. And we are in production. We finished the pilot the stage, and now we're in the implementation. And there's a lot of interest from different organizations. They want to continue supporting us. And they're calling us to open other economic units, but we want to start strong since we finished the pilot space. Actually, the training it takes six weeks to eight weeks. Now we're training. We have more. We have people waiting to be hired. We, we're hoping to hire in the ten years almost three hundred to four hundred women. Okay, if we develop the fifteen units, we're hoping we can do more. And we don't want to do a factory. We want to have a small scale. You know, this collective thing. And I think our uh, did I answer that question? The training we want to. So yeah, so the competitive advantage to these toys is, um, first of all, the surplus material, recycled material, they save probably per toy about two pounds of wasted material going into the landfill. Um, the other thing is the story behind the toy. There's a, you know, there's a lot of people that, yes, could probably sit down and try to sew alphabet letters. Would they be as nice? No, I don't think so. Um, and and the story behind the women making these toys um, has been huge in uh, promoting these products. Another advantage, I believe, and we didn't mention it, is the profit after we pay for the expenses when we start growing, we making really, we want to support the educational program. So the profit will go back to the community and support the women and the children. Um, I'll see I'm not really familiar with the economy within a refugee camp in terms of you know, the, how the commerce takes place. I'm just curious in terms of um, what would be beneficial to the you know, current economic unit you've developed to expand that one and to get the growth within that specific refugee camp as opposed to um, doing these smaller units across a variety of refugee camps. I'm just curious if it would just be beneficial for this one refugee camp to be really concentrated and how that really benefits the women working there and also their children within that. Um, I, I think this is a good question. If we should uh, expand and grow inside one camp or other different camps, it's, there's a philosophical question in it, and we were struggling with it for the last few months on that issue because it's, we want them to we want them to stay in a camp, so if we provide them more opportunities for them in the camp, that's a philosophical question. We're struggling with. I think what's happening is we want to give everybody the opportunity for employment. So we don't mind growing in one camp, but we want to give the other. We want to give the opportunity for everybody. That's the perspective. That's the approach we're going with. I would also add that when we when we looked at this, it makes sense to um, continue to make the first unit. Stronger and profitable before they think about taking on another unit to grow. It 
it doesn't make sense um, to go out and expand right now uh, where they stand. Right now, they need to concentrate on pushing their product sales and also hiring the 20 women that are on the waiting list before um, they go out and start another women. Uh, what's your experience been selling? Has it been, has it been a good success with sort of numbers or what you expected? Um, have you had to change your approach on your marketing? And what's it been like selling the product itself? So, so your question is how has our experience been selling the toys? So the, the issue really was that there were very low sales. And that was due to not a lot of people knew about the organization. And um, the prices of the toy themselves were really high. And so we had to look at um, what made sense in terms of how could we um, help the women cut hours and um, manufacturing time, if you will, to make the products um, in a price range that people were to be. Uh, the team um, that worked on this project really did a great job of taking these products out to the community and talking with over 20 different, you know, parents, teachers, um, retail owners, anyone that they could get the product in front of. We got fabulous feedback, and everyone loved the products. Um, but you know, it, it was kind of like everyone wanted something a little bit different. When we first were introduced to the product, we thought, okay, these are awesome for schools, and they're awesome for teachers. Realistically, schools. Only probably select few. They're probably more in your specialty uh, customers that are going to buy the toys, and um, and teachers probably won't spend their salaries on some of the toys. So we had to kind of shift how we wanted to market and how we wanted to advertise the products, and that's really with the feedback that we got from different retail owners. And when they saw the story behind the product, it was much more than just much more than just a toy. So the feedback that we got, we shifted to selling it more as a socially conscious toy or socially conscious um, good rather than just um, an educational toy for teachers. Cool. Oh, go ahead. I, I would like to add that part of it, that's true, uh, but we've been successful in selling it in whole and more individually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm selling it right now. I don't have enough product to sell. I'm the main distributor, and in, in the garden now they're interested, and they're interested in the school. We learned something that the U.S., most of individual will buy it as a grandma, grandpa to their children, grandchildren, but in other areas they're buying it for their school system. In Germany, they're interested to purchase our product for special needs because they are soft, touch and and so on. So we learned that every different region wants it for different purposes. So we're selling it as a social conscious and we want to sell them as a good, high quality tool. Okay, I have, I have a question. With what I do, I know that a third world investment takes hands on the ground to really manage. Can you talk about and sort of enlighten everybody in the room? How does it work with you being here selling, promoting, and then Who's managing the operation on the ground over there in Palestine? We, we have managers for Toys for Hope in Palestine. I talk with them almost every weekend on Skype. And we, we pass the training because while we were trained, I was in the building in Palestine working with them hands on. But now we have a manager. We have we have started building the structure for the unit. Like we have to produce that amount of toys. If the toy takes 20, this is what, how much we need to, to produce every week. We have a manager, I communicate with them, and we, we, with the help of uh, the team, we started thinking about how we're going to give more ownership for the unit so they will have a decision in the process. So we, we're shifting to give them more ownership than here at the end, but we're guiding them in the process. Okay, so. We have a weekly weekly calls. Weekly email and Viber. We yeah. have multiple communications. WhatsApp. WhatsApp, okay. all of it, and Vibes. There's some other ones. 
Okay, so another another question. This is on the ambassador model. Um, where are you in the process of the ambassador model? I know just from experience, it's very difficult to do an ambassador model unless you have someone that can focus full time times ten on that model, really driving the individual consultants and salespeople in the U.S. Keep them motivated. Keep them interested. Have you guys created that process? And as a room of entrepreneurs, I know. I think some of the advice would probably be to do a test run very quickly and see if that's something that even just a local church community in Tulsa would be willing to run with and just trial it. Can you sort of talk about that and maybe give a little overview for people who that don't know what an ambassador model is just quickly? Tupperware, basically. Sure. <laughs> okay. So the ambassador model really came about when we were doing some of our benchmarking and looking at some other successful socially conscious um, organizations and a lot of the um, successful companies employ an ambassador model basically that's different than an independent sales rep but they are responsible for um, they would purchase sample products from Toys for Hope they don't have to have the full product line but they are responsible for having uh, products to show people. And um, Choice for Hope's responsibility is also to help um, train them and to kind of give them uh, all the information that they would need for a home party or a trunk show. This is no different than your um, you said Tupperware, but um, Seiko does jewelry. Um, you know, Scentsy parties. I, I don't want to say Arbonne or Mary Kay because those typically are associated with a, a pyramid scheme. This is not a pyramid scheme. This is um, basically your one person responsible for um, hosting your house party, selling the products, really telling the story that sometimes gets overlooked in just a normal retail store, and um, having the products in front of people where they can um, touch them and, and, and experience them. We also found that a lot of people tend to buy products based off of another personal relationship. So in that regards, it's been really successful. In terms of testing it, um, one of our team members actually did have an ambassador. She basically was an ambassador um, this semester and had a um, trunk show and had some success. But in terms of where we're at with developing it, that's something that still is totally brand new to us. So any advice or anything like that would be um, fantastic. Uh, but it is something that we've recommended, but it still needs to be fleshed out. I, I have a question for you. When you referred to the team and CCW, will you clarify sure. who those people are sure. and, and how, they, how they will work with Toys for Hope? At all? Okay, sure, absolutely. So. Um, Choice for Hope was this year's, um, or this semester's project for CCW. CCW is the Center for Creation of Economic Wealth at OE Tulsa. And I was the team leader this semester. There was a group of um, three, three other graduate students. Kristen is actually one of them. And um, we were basically given the project. And um, so we came up with recommendations to help with their um, distribution and marketing strategies to help them grow and help them become, um, become sustainable. And so um, basically we have, have now gotten to the end of our project and this is really actually an exciting time for Dr. Kobashi and Kendall because we're basically handed over our recommendations and so we can't wait to see what they, what they do with them. If you, in the near future, uh, have a bunch of boutiques or groundswell home parties just take off, do you have the ability right now to keep up with uh, supply? Let me take the next. Uh, World Vision has been talking with us for the last seven months to open a new unit. We have other people in Jordan, they want to open another unit. And we, did, we don't approach these people. They come to us and say, let's open another unit. So if we feel like we're getting more demands, we're going to immediately take this opportunity and open more units. 
we're even thinking about in future uh, to have our main distribution in Jordan. So we'll go directly from Jordan and develop the whole thing. We're in the process of thinking next month there's somebody is going to go and start thinking about it in Jordan, how we're going to develop. We're, we have big goals, we are so ambitious and we're hoping that everybody's going to come and knock on the door, we want that door to open. So we're thinking ahead. We're, we're, we, we have potentials of people who want to fund us and move on. Uh, do you mind giving us an example of uh, this, like the women you employ in refugee camps and how participating in the Jewish Republic has improved their quality of life and maybe that of their children? Actually, this is a, it's, it's, I'm humbled. You know, I'm, I talk about this organization, uh, this, uh, our organization, and uh, I believe if it wasn't for the women, it would not exist. Their life has improved so much. I know on a basic level, a woman has been suffering uh, from toothache for more than eight months. And when she started working, she could not afford it. She had to take all of her teeth, and she was 31 years old. And if it wasn't for our project, she would not have teeth. She's 20, 31 years old. And I'm like, God, oh, this is terrible. Okay. There's another woman, her child wanted to go to a college, and now she can afford the minimum, at least a fee, to go and tell to let her child go to college. Her, her grades are fabulous. So it's, it's improving their life. There's, like they want to continue working. They always say, Janine, I hope we're not shutting down. This is so important for us. So it's, it's, it's improving their life far more than I expected. I really love what you guys are doing, and I want to ask, just to recap here, how can we help you? I mean, obviously, I know from talking with you, you that you have a couple possible employment opportunities in the future that you're looking for in the U.S., and then also, if someone wanted to volunteer their time, would they be able to connect with you, obviously buy the toys? Can you sort of walk us through, what are you looking for in the next six months that we could help you with? Actually, I would, uh, I would like to... So encourage you to buy our toys, our product. Take brochures, we brought our brochures, samples of the product. We're, we're interested in feedback on the website or someone who could help us to improve our website. You know, marketing, in terms of marketing, we need that kind of help. And if you have ideas on how we, we should distribute, contact, if you people or boutique, please call me, I will go with you and talk with the boutique. There's someone in, I know in Tulsa, we, we know Taylor took us to a boutique, we know somebody else, my student took me to another boutique, and anybody, you know, someone, you know, someone who could take our product to the boutique, I'm there, any day, any time, doesn't matter. U.S., Europe, in the Gulf, anywhere. It doesn't matter. Three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock. I'm always there. It's amazing. <laughs> so, please. All right. Well, let's let's give to her. <laughs> Concludes our one million cups. Remember, we won't be meeting the next two weeks, January 8th. We will be back. If you're interested in presenting, go to one million cups.com backslash Tulsa and fill out the online form. We're looking for people to uh, speak. We're, I think, booked through about January right now, but we have the open spots, so uh, just uh, go on there and apply. Thanks for coming out today.